Hey everybody, this episode of RSA Coded is brought to you in part by No Wave Academy. No Wave Academy provides online instructional workshops from some of today's best fine artists. Some of the artists include Mia Bergeron, Paul Christina, Nick Runke, Daniel Seagrove, John Wentz, and many more. A lot of these artists have actually been featured on Artists Decoded as well, so definitely go check out the archive to check those out. The Academy recently released an oil painting from life workshop with master oil painter Sean Cheatham. Artist Decoded is offering 10% off of all of their online workshops, so please go to nowaveacademy.com, type in AD-10 at checkout for 10% off. Now, on to the episode. My advice for artists and creatives, I mean, I kind of tapped into it earlier, but I think that you need to be yourself. Find yourself as much as you can. If it doesn't feel like home, it's not you, and that's the wrong way. If you run into that wall that is fearful, you need to keep going even if it hurts, even if it causes pain. You need to break through it because that will be your breakthrough as an artist and a creative. If it feels safe, it's not worth it. If it feels unsafe, it's worth it. Trust that everything happens for a reason. Accept that all of your work is not going to be great. You will make mistakes and it's okay. And that's it. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. This is your host Yoshino and you're listening to episode number 152 of Ars Decoded. And in this episode, I get the opportunity to talk to dancer and choreographer Dina Thompson. She's a person that I've known for a while through our mutual circle of friends in the industry, but we never sat down and had a conversation until this conversation last month. And She's an extremely talented dancer and choreographer. She's someone that I truly respect, and she's worked with the likes of Madonna, David Bowie, Justin Timberlake, Snoop Dogg, Florence and the Machine, and Sia, to name a few. I'm also providing a few video links to her work on our new and improved website, artistdecoded.com, where you can see one of her music videos for Cigarose, which starred her alongside actor Shia LaBeouf. If you want to follow her on Instagram, her handle is at Dina Thompson. Before I forget, please go to our iTunes page and leave us a review. It helps reviewers just like yourself to hear about this podcast. And without further ado, here is my conversation with dancer and choreographer Dina Thompson. I guess that's it. All right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, why are we having too much fun? I don't know. I don't know. This is this is <laughs> is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? I don't, I don't know. know. Are I we gonna? This get... is a serious art podcast. <laughs> are we gonna get anything done? No, probably not. I'll look no. this way, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just we won't look at each other the entire time. That's the best way to have a conversation <laughs> with someone. So. Because we, yeah, we're used to talking to ourselves kind of, right? Exactly. Yeah. We have this interesting self-dialogue that perpetuates every part of our lives. And uh, <laughs> and then there's <laughs> a bit of silence. I, don't I know. mean, it was kind of interesting. Okay. Good okay. good experiment. Well, Ready? Serious. I'm serious. Yeah, we're serious. Okay. Uh, okay. So I guess this is where it starts. But yeah, th- yeah thanks for coming. Thank you for shooting today as well. And uh, I guess we can start by um, how did you get into dance? I got into dance because, as my mother says, I was three years old dancing on my dining room table to Michael Jackson. And that was a big no-no. So she just put me in dance class and thought that it would take care of it. But I never left that dance class. So I've, I've kind of always been dancing since I could walk, I guess. But 
Yeah, so I kind of like took it seriously. I went to college to get my Bachelor of Arts at Colorado State and then eventually moved to California in 2012 to kind of be a professional dancer and take my dream to the next level. Wow. There was this, I forget exactly what podcast this was, but I think it might've been Hidden Brain. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about early on, I think this is before like that kind of wave of diagnoses of people having ADHD was like really well known. But it was talking about this lady who started taking a lot of dance classes when she was young uh, instead of getting put on medication, like I guess happens uh, a lot with people who have, uh, who are like diagnosed with ADHD, but probably shouldn't. Um, I don't know exactly where I'm going with this, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. it's okay. but I guess, were you a pretty hyperactive kid growing up? First of all, I think that all children are hyperactive. So no, I don't agree with ADHD, but you know, that dance is really therapeutic because not only do they use it for a hyperactive children but they also use it as therapy for like alzheimer's and dementia and they found that it can really ground these people and get their memories starting to come back to them so it it actually is a really healing meditative physical practice that we can do to help people with mental illness and hyperactive children it's like because i think one of the most beneficial things about dance is Number one, the discipline, the discipline, the discipline to know your body, the discipline to shape your body. And then also you have a certain criteria that you have to follow. You have a certain syllabus to follow and there's a standard for that. So it's just like every athlete. But I think the discipline is probably the like most important thing for dance. And that's why I think it does help with children that are hyperactive Mm. and probably Alzheimer's it's disciplining your mind to focus on one thing. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. speaking of the discipline aspects, being able to at a very young age, start taking dance classes and utilizing that as like a, uh, I guess something that you can focus on and be able to utilize as, yeah, I mean to ingrain this idea of discipline in your life. Do you think that has carried on into the other things and the way that you approach life in general? I do think that the discipline in dance has helped shape my life today just because, you know, there's structure. And I think for everyone to have a successful life, you have to have structure. There needs to be a path to follow. And I think that's what I learned from dance, especially now as an adult, to have structure in my life. I also know that when you learn how much to push yourself, How far can you go? How far can you go until you fall? And I think that is something in life as well, that some people don't test those boundaries. And I think dance is the literal way to test those boundaries. And I also think that with dance, it's it's such a world of rejection, more rejection than acceptance. And I think as a person having to deal with 98% of rejection your whole life, you learn how to find self-acceptance and self-awareness and you learn how to love yourself through all of this rejection. So you're also doing exterior work and you're also doing interior work, maybe without you knowing, Mm. but it's happening simultaneously. Um, So it can be a very mental battle being a dancer, but I think With the discipline that you have and having the support system around you, you learn how to make the best of the world that you are kind of growing up in as a dancer. Mm. Um, So it's like dealing with that as well as an adult. And um, so I think that's how I how I relate it to my adult life now. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I guess. So when did you become conscious of that? Because you're saying that you're learning it simultaneously, like understanding that you'll get rejections in life and constantly getting the rejections and being okay with and being able to look inward and and find some sort of semblance within yourself and some peace within yourself. I guess, when did you become conscious of that? Yeah, so I think understanding the rejection and understanding myself as, as an artist, I think came when I was... About 24 years old. And it came because I was 
having my agents and everyone around me telling me that I needed to be this person for this choreographer. I needed to look this certain way if I wanted to dance for this artist. I needed to have this body type because the artist was either bigger or smaller than me. So I couldn't be the same as that artist. So I needed to be this one thing. And as I found myself trying to mold into whatever I thought that these people wanted me to be, I kept getting rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected. To that one point, I remember breaking down in my room because I didn't understand because I was doing everything that everyone has told me up until this point. And I broke down and one of my mentors just told me that all I needed to do was be myself. And everyone tells you that I feel like majority of your life. And it didn't click until this very moment when I was 24. And I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to be myself. And once that happened, I started to like delve into my artistry. Like, no, I want to be the weird creature dark girl. And I want to dance like I I'm having schizophrenia and like all of this stuff. And I just started to explore more outside of what I have been taught. And in that moment of exploration, I found that rejection didn't matter to me anymore. Once I didn't care about dressing up for this person and wanting to be next to this artist, once I started focusing on my art and what made me happy, it didn't matter who rejected me because I was satisfied. I was at peace with my own art. Yeah. And also I think that when you are at peace with your own art and yourself as an artist, that's when you become the most successful. Mm -hmm. The more that we can tap into our own, to ourselves and look inward and also tap into our subconscious mind and be able to access that place and have trust and faith in that place, the more that we can actually attain the things that are true to our, to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, this could even be related to like Taoism and Buddhism, but, um, and I I guess essentially trying to find that place of Nirvana Mm -hmm. within ourselves. But I think at the end of the day, the more that we trust our own unique sensibilities, um, the more that we can actually reap certain rewards even if it's not immediate but constantly are able to go down that pathway yes no i can i completely agree because i also think that what people stray away from is once they start getting scared or fearful like when they're in exploration of art or themselves when they start to get scared they pull back when that's actually the opposite of what we should be doing as artists like when you are when you enter that wall of fear You need to push through it. You need to go past it because that is the boundary that is holding you back from becoming whatever you are supposed to become in that moment. So as artists, we need to see that fear, accept that fear, challenge the fear and move past it because that is the breakthrough as an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Recently, I've been, um, I've I've just been writing a lot, uh, just for myself and just understanding um, the way that I like to think. But I've been constantly thinking about this idea of finding comfortability in uncomfortability. So constantly challenging your mind, constantly challenging yourself to do things that you felt were impossible for yourself. And whether that's physically or mentally or, you know, I think those are all challenges that are microcosms that present new neurological pathways that you can create for yourself and um and even thinking about defining our own standards you know um defining or defining our new um normal i think is something to think about Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean that's interesting that you talk about writing because i think that a lot of people ask me what I do to become inspired, Mm -hmm. which is one of the most interesting questions because I don't, I don't know if I know that answer for myself. And I want to ask you too, just because I don't know, it's such a weird question. Like, what are you inspired by? Because it literally could be an answer of everyday life. I could tell you everyday life yeah, because I learn something constantly through everyday life. But one of the things that I like to do is write. I love Mm -hmm. writing because it teaches me so much about how I'm thinking 
And when I go back, I'm like, wow, why was I thinking this way or where was I? Or then what I find is that I'll start to write and then five pages later, I have no idea what I've written down and it probably doesn't have anything to do with the first page. But now I've gone into this like ethereal world that I just created and now I have a dance routine on five pages or like a different character. Yeah. So I think, I don't know, writing it just, I yeah. was like, oh, and then inspiration. I, But I feel like, I mean... <clears throat> I mean, I feel like inspiration is just observation. Yes. You can get inspired by literally anything. You can sit there. I mean, maybe this is like the psychedelics, you know, kind of coming out. <laughs> and, 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 it's fine. Yeah, that, that I'm currently on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't tell you, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, literally, like, you could get... So I started writing... <laughs> This is going to sound so, so, uh, so funny, but I started writing this, this short story about a toothbrush mm -hmm. and I think the interesting thing about a toothbrush and in and, and the beginning of the story, I go through like the history of the toothbrush and like, you don't exactly know where it's going, but, um, what I notice is that the toothbrush is kind of a microcosm for a relationship because when you start a relationship with someone, uh, you know, it's like kind of a rite of passage or something, you know, where, you know, it's like, oh, you're, you're staying over for the first time. And then, uh, you know, it's like, oh, I have toothbrush and blah, blah, blah. And, but at the end of that relationship, you know, the toothbrush has so much more meaning because then you have to throw that toothbrush away. And, um, and even the conscious decision of, of, of throwing that object away, which is a representation of this relationship in a certain way. Um, I thought it was really interesting and, but you know, I think inspiration can come from literally anything. And I think like the more observant you are to your surroundings and the nuance of things, then the more that you can actually understand how you think, why you think that way and what is meaningful to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Completely agree. I don't have anything more to add to that. Like, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, yeah, it just, but I think like, and that's where I, I've been thinking of the, the idea of just going more inward, you know, mm -hmm. instead of, uh, external, you know, and outward. Mm -hmm. I think the more that you understand yourself, the more that you understand the way that you intake things. And that's, you know, the writing practice. I mean, I'm curious, like what you do with your writing practice as, as well. Yeah, I don't, I, do, I mean, there's not really kind of a, a, structure that I really do okay yes there is probably what I do is I turn on music and I love it because what happens is my mind goes to a different place and then I just start writing and I create characters and it's almost like the sound of the music makes my body feel whatever feeling the music is implying and then from there, when I decipher the mood or the feeling, then I create characters. If they're, if it's a family, if it's women, if it's men, if it's children, and I start to write about this scenario of relationships, like your little toothbrush. Or the, I like write about a father and a daughter, or a father and a son, and I create these relationships on these pieces of paper, and I write down the movement and how it should feel and what my goal is at the end of the song. Mm. And then I just leave it. And sometimes if I need to go create a piece, I'll look back at this journal or sometimes they don't get created, which is fine. It's just like making sure that your creative genius is constantly flowing through and that it's working because that's the thing is it has to be working. Otherwise, it's dusty and you have to learn how to use it again and all this mm -hmm. stuff. So you have to keep it up to date, mm -hmm. programmed, ready yeah. to go, you know, so yeah. they're kind of in my pocket. And now I just feel like I need to go back and look at my journal because mm. I haven't in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Like the interesting thing about having a journal too, is that maybe at that particular moment, you're just trying to, you're figuring something out or you're tapped into that specific moment and you're describing the things that you're thinking of at that particular time. And when you look at it, like even when I do a photo shoot or something, I, I like to look at the photos that day and then because it's kind of weighted with these certain feelings towards the photos, cause, you know, you just do the photo shoot and then come back to it a month and a year later and see if there's anything that even like cropping into an image or you discover something new. 
And I think that is also just kind of like a microcosm of just life in general, because when you, when you're in a situation in a conversation or, or, or in a relationship or something, you have a certain perspective of it because you're in it. But when you have distance from it, then you have a new perspective, a perspective that's less weighted from, um, I guess like the visceral ness of, of that mm-hmm. particular moment, you know, you can kind of be more objective with things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know. I've just been thinking of that <laughs> recently. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is interesting. Yeah. I guess. I guess as a choreographer and a dancer, I really don't go back to my work, my past work, just because I was at such a different time. And even though I probably, I, of course, it is a learning process, and I can look back at my work and be like, "Oh, wow, I, I, I know so much." more than I do when I did. I know so much more than I did. I know so much. Why am I having trouble with that? I know so much more now than I did back then. Yes. Uh, There it is. Um, But just because like it is at a different point in your life. And I feel like as artists, since we're constantly evolving and progressing, that I have to do it justice and service to just let it go to not go back and reshape it, to not go back because I always find that I am not satisfied, which is another interesting thing about an artist. Are you ever satisfied with your work? No, right? Because I'm not either. I hate everything I do. Why is that? I don't understand that. But I've accepted it. I mean, it could, I don't know. I mean, Yeah, what is that? Uh... Like, why don't we just ever look at something and we're like, wow, I did really good. I did really good. Have you ever told yourself that when you like look at something? I've never done that. It depends what it is. For me, at least. Mm -hmm. Depends what it is. You've never done that where you look at some of the projects that you've done and. No. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out in this very moment. <laughs> let's figure it, Let's figure this out. Let's dive into that. <laughs> well, I think it might be. I mean, it might be something that I have to talk about in therapy, but I think it just might be because I know that there's always something to work on. Something can always be better. Art can always be better. Like everything. It can always be better. But mm. maybe that's. That's the bad part about dance discipline is that it's never good enough. It can always be better. Mm. Is that mindset? Yeah. Then I guess for us to be honest and understand if that is a secondhand, second-handed value that's mm. been passed down to us from people that have taught us, um, is that something that is so ingrained within our society to want to constantly push for more and to be greater and to be better. It could be that, or is it, um, something that I guess is within ourself to that sort of like drive and ambition, because I, I also feel like that drive and ambition could be a disease if you don't understand what that, where that, or, or why you have that drive and ambition. Because constantly pushing yourself further and further and further, you're actually damaging yourself if you don't understand why. I'm not saying that that's the case for you, but this is just something that I think about. Yeah, no, totally. I do. I do think that you have a valid point in that. I think I just. Why don't I find it? I just want to do more. I'm so selfish. I want to do more. I want to do better. I want to do, you know, or yeah. maybe it's, I I mean, it could be the fear of rejection, maybe. Mm. So I'm telling myself that I, I'm not going to like it because they won't like it mm. just to protect yeah. myself. Yeah. I mean, it could be what I've just noticed is this, all these sort of compounding, complicated emotions. It doesn't have to necessarily be uh, one note either, you know, Mm. it's, it's, it could be everything all at once, Mm. you know, it could be about a fear of rejection, but it could be about this drive and this motivation and this hubris. But I think the best thing that I've learned is, is to balance things out with a healthy ego, you know, because I think the idea of like ego death 
is kind of unrealistic. You know, I think that is like closely tied to when people do psychedelics for the first time. You know, it's like, oh, you're going to experience like an ego death. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's necessarily the case because a balanced ego is 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 a healthy ego is is probably more realistic. Yes. But um, yeah. Yeah. Why did we start talking about that? No idea. We were talking about journaling inspiration and then i got into my flaw of not liking anything that i do so weird going into the rabbit hole (laughs) i know totally yeah we're going into the rabbit hole (laughs) we did yeah so i'm curious like how i mean you know speaking of that kind of last series of questions but um what does dance mean to you now dance and choreography like and how have you utilized that to just transform yourself or, or maybe the, the past couple of years, like how, like how has it transformed for you? Dance has always meant something more to me when I was in my twenties is where I, I learned that it was more about the story for me, which was never taught before that. It wasn't about story. It was about technique how many turns you could do, how high your legs were. And then when I went to college, I learned the importance of how dance could tell a story. And I will always remember my professor, Chung Fu Chang, talking to me about the story. Every day, every moment, a gesture meant something, and it had to mean something every single time you moved. And so from there, I have taken that and implemented it into all of my choreography today. I never choreograph something that doesn't have a meaning and I talk about it with my students. It's, it's almost as if the story is more important to me than the movement, because if you don't have the story, then the movement doesn't matter. And that's just the same as body language. When you talk to someone, you can tell how they feel that day. You can tell if they're happy or if they're sad, just by the way that they're standing or how they're talking. It's the same with dance. You can understand if there's a story and a feeling behind it, and you can understand if there's not. So that has always been in my journey ever since I got done with college until today. And so I've been exploring that, and something that I've been really fascinated by is buto dancing. And... I love it because it's the expression that it shows is mind boggling to me. And I don't know why, Mm -hmm. because I think it's so visually jarring that it makes you feel very uncomfortable as an audience member. And I love that. Um, So I started to delve into all of these expressive faces when I dance and trying to emote in that same way while telling a story of darkness. I love that it's just called the dance of darkness. Um, That's one of my biggest inspirations actually is Butoh dance. Um, But yeah, I think, I think majority of it is just the story, which I think that a lot of people forget that we're here to tell a story. We're actually here to help the audience go through a journey of life and, Mm. and feeling and to remember that they have a heart. I think that we forget and it just becomes some yeah. mundane trick. Yeah. It's interesting how people are easily seduced by sort of things that don't matter, such as the accumulation of money. And, you know, that's like so highly regarded and like meritocracy, like in our society, there are things in this life that are so much more important than just accumulating wealth the connection that you have with your friends, the connection that you have with your parents. And, you know, and and it's interesting how, because of how our society is structured, it almost facilitates this, um, this sort of like emptiness and the, and, and people turn into zombies in certain ways. And, uh, I mean, speaking of Budo, you know, it's kind of an encapsulation of, the, of like zombie almost movements, but mm-hmm. in, in, a, in an exaggerated sort of intense way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I love Budo dance too. And I, I can't 
I mean, I guess I could try to articulate why, but uh, there's just something very visceral about and and primal about the movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think that's what art, I think that when art becomes like what you're saying, if it's, if it has another, what what's the word I'm looking for? But if there's like another goal behind the art, if it's like to make a lot of money or if it's like this art is to, I don't know, but if you can't find the meaning behind it, if there is no meaning to it, then people aren't connected to it. They can't find the relationship with that piece to themselves and they're disconnected. And the whole point about art is to make them feel connected, to make them have a judgment. Everyone should have an opinion. Everyone should have judgment on art. And the fact that we can be okay with not having a judgment or be offended by when people have a judgment about art we're not we're not we're not doing it right we're not doing it correctly like people Mm -hmm. need to understand that art is there to make you feel something if it's good or if it's bad but it's there to make you feel something and that i think is what artists forget about Mm -hmm. but also not to have the pressure as an artist to like oh i have to make something grand so that people feel something i think if you're in the moment it will happen naturally but I mean, I think that's why I have problems with some of the art today is that I just don't see passion behind it. Yeah. Um, but I think that, I mean, that I think you bring up a good point because I think some people are just disconnected in general mm-hmm. and the disconnection with art, you know, like maybe art for commercial purposes or for monetary purposes. Some people just collect pieces to essentially invest their money in, you know, so that, uh, it could double and triple and, you know, and make them Mm -hmm. lots of profit. So it's not really even about art as an artistic perspective or like art with taste. It's more about art for commerce. It's just for commerce. Mm. And I think that's, I mean, going to the meritocracy thing, it's just because artwork sells for, a certain amount of money, like a large amount of money doesn't necessarily mean that it's any better than art that is naive or art. I mean, this could be even related into dance, you know, it's dance and movement is an expression. You're expressing something. So for someone to put it in a category to where it's like, that's not proper technique. Mm. It's, this is no, this is an expression of, of who I am. And the more that I think people are express who they are in general, whether it's dance or through or through another medium, painting or, or whatever, the more that they can actually feel that sort of connection with themselves, which hopefully resonates out to others. Absolutely. This is another one of those yes, yes, yeses. But I think that I think that I, I don't yeah. know. I guess I would have to really like contemplate and think whether I think artists collectively are doing that, but I feel if I could give my opinion about the dance world, I don't feel like dancers are taking a leap towards that. I feel like they're more focused on popularity than the art itself and they're forgetting about it. And I wish that we could collectively just remember that it doesn't matter about any of these fake things that are happening in the commercial world. Um, Yeah. I just wanted to share my opinion about that one, I guess. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I think that brings that brings up a good point. And I mean, is that also where the inception of Congress came into play? Yeah, Congress Congress happened because I mean, Zach, so with my partner Zach Ryan Schlegel, so we created Congress, which is the Salon Collective dance event in Los Angeles where we ask eight choreographers to come and showcase work. It's very intimate. Um, It's in a 360 because we believe that the performer should be on the same level as the audience to not make the dancers feel that they are above the audience. But so we both have different stories of how Congress was created. So this is my version of how Congress was created. I was dancing for a really big artist at the Super Bowl in 2012. 
And unfortunately, it was not the dream I thought it was going to be. It was, it made me question why I was a dancer. It made me question my whole life. It made me question my dream because I just was not satisfied. I was not happy. I thought that that's where I wanted to be. And so I wanted to create a show where the dancer felt like they were the most important, that they were the talent, that they were the ones that people were clapping for because they work so hard. It is the most physically demanding job in the entertainment industry, maybe besides stunt workers, but they are the most underpaid. We don't even have contracts. They barely give us water. It's no, it's not even a joke. So I wanted to create a platform where they felt like they were important. And that's what we do at Congress. We pay our artists. We give them free space. We give them a good dance floor. We give them food. We give them water, all the basic necessities that you need in life. And that's how Congress was made in my, on my behalf. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I think a lot of people that are outside of the arts don't understand the things that, that artists go through. People can speculate and, but I mean, yeah, even with, uh, dancers, you know, I think like, I mean, I think there is a lot of mistreatment that goes on. Dancers, they contribute so much to a lot of projects, but it's almost like you're the afterthought, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but like, like the, the crew gets fed and blah, blah, blah. But, um, for some reason it's like, why, why, do, why do people think that the dancers are the afterthought? Oh, I was on the crew list with the dog trainer. I was put hmm. under the category of miscellaneous crew and it was me hmm. and the dog trainer. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. what? A what? Yeah. I did not train my whole life to be next to the dog trainer. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And then in credits, I go next to catering. Are, are we talking about a, a film project or? Yeah, they were both different projects, but yes, yeah. it's either TV or film. I can't remember which one it I was. Yeah. But uh, well, yeah, I mean, and then when you look at you know, just to blast them out. But if you look at artists, I mean, I think they did a couple of articles on it. It was either Variety. No, it was Rolling Stone. They did an article about how dancers are being exploited and working for free because this past year in 2019, I think Beyonce tried to hire dancers for $200 to work. I don't know the exact specifics, but to like work a 12 hour day. $200. I mean, that's insane. Yeah, that's insane. But no one's getting in trouble for it. But then there's, you know, young dancers who are like, yeah, it's great exposure. But really what they're doing is they're just setting us back. And that's the other thing is camaraderie, you know, like standing together as one, you know, like that's why the Directors Guild is so important and strong because they all stand together and fight for one thing mm -hmm. just like the writers they all went on strike and dropped all of their agents because they weren't happy with their contract as dancers we are so divided as artists that it is a joke we can't even stand together mm. if i'm if i'm gonna sit here and be like no you want to know what we need to get paid we need food and i'm gonna step away from the job there's a little naive little young baby who just moved here who's like, oh, I'll do Justin Bieber for free mm. for exposure Yeah, when he has millions of dollars. Yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. frustrating. Definitely. Now I'm just going on another tangent. <laughs> Don't get me started. No, I mean, it's <laughs> no, it's 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 something that needs to be talked about. I mean, the, the, the same thing happens. I guess we're talking also about just people's ambition for fame as well, because I encountered that also with photography when I was working as like a professional photographer and people were underbidding you and doing things for free. And I mean, now with magazines, I mean, no one's really getting paid unless you're shooting for like Elle or Vogue. Yeah. That's insane to me. Yeah. I mean, but that that's a whole nother that's a whole other system too, because print is dying. And the, the thing is, is that people will, that are good photographers will do things for free. And because 
people will do things for free. These big corporations feel like they don't need to pay anyone anymore. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's the same with music videos. I music video budgets are like completely under budget Mm -hmm. um, compared to what they were five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so everything continues to get perpetuated, but the artists have to stand up for um, basically if, if no one had artists to do these things, that we're willing to do these things for free, then these companies wouldn't be able to exploit the artists. Yes, that's absolutely correct. But I also think that with this new age of like new media, that it's almost moving so fast that it's it's hard for all of us to keep up. Mm-hmm. With all the content and all the all the different contracts and the legal the legality and all of this stuff, it's it's hard. I think because these motherfuckers are moving fast. (laughs) Like, damn. Yeah. And now the whole thing with the now I'm just segueing into another thing, but the whole new tax. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh! I don't even tax stuff. Yeah. Like I don't really know what. Am I fucked? Are we fucked? I don't know. I don't know. We could totally be fucked. We're fucked. <laughs> we're I just mean, fucked now. We're talking oh my about God. it. Yeah. 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 Let's not go. The, let's not go into that. Yeah. I, I don't know all the stipulations behind it, but I, I think from what I've heard from my friends that are producers that produce projects all the time is that unless you are, uh, an incorporated like an S corp or an LLC that the production company has to pay, I think 22% more on top of your fee to the government. Wow. This is just what I've heard. Yeah, I get it. I need to, <laughs> people will have to fact, fact check this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The, but uh, um, yeah, I, I heard it's not, it's not a good thing. 2020. Yeah, it's not a good thing. Yeah. But um, we're already struggle, struggling artists. What are we going to be now? Yeah. Drowning artists? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> drowning, I don't know. Which one? Artists. Quicksand? I don't yeah. know. Which is which is crazy because to think too, because I mean to put your career into perspective, I mean you've worked on like a lot of different projects from working with Shia LaBeouf and doing the Cigarosa video to working on Book Smart with Olivia Wilde and working with Sia. And you know, so you're essentially at a level where you're at the pinnacle of where a lot of dancers would want to be. But what is your perspective on just the way things are, are moving right now? Like to say it shortly, I guess, like, do you see your career as a dancer and choreographer being a viable way to make a living going forward with all of these, you know, different things that are happening right now? I think that being a dancer and a choreographer, like any artist, is a hard career to have a substantial lifelong career. And I am actually in that place in my life right now where I'm questioning whether or not I can continue just because it's such a competitive field. Um, you know, and I've, I've hustled and fought for so long that I don't know if I have that bite in me anymore. Um, which is a scary feeling as an artist to feel just, you know, there's a lot of young people coming in that are really hungry. it's like, after you've spent 12 years doing this in the industry, like, I don't know if I have that, I don't know if I have that fire anymore, you Mm. know, but I also think it's hard, especially as a choreographer, just because we don't have, we don't have a contract with SAG. They look at us as if we're nothing. So there's nothing that gives me health and pension it's all to a producer's discretion so most of the time when i'm on a job i have to really kiss ass if i want to get health and pension Mm. which is a shame because i deserve it i'm working really hard i mean everyone else on that job is getting it but me and then you know we don't have a base salary so we have to negotiate that every single time so that's a fight every day Mm. and I think that successful choreographers, they come and they go, just like every new hot commodity. There's not really one choreographer that 
stays up at the top for their entire lives. Mm -hmm. One that I know of is the queen herself, Fatima Robinson, and that's because she's a queen <laughs> and she knew how to do it business wise, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, you know, you come and you go. Mm. So is it substantial? It is for me now, but my time will come, mm. unfortunately. Mm. So then I guess understanding that, like how do you shift? Like how do you... <laughs> I mean, there's, 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 <laughs> I mean, we're, we're going to, hey, we're going to figure this shit out right now. <laughs> we're going to figure out how we're going to shift your career right now, right here, right now. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll give this a little anecdote from just my experiences yeah, and maybe this will, this will help a little bit, but Pre-2015, before I started the podcast, I was working as a professional photographer. I was shooting pr photography jobs and com commercial projects and things like that and doing freelance stuff. And then I just saw that photography, like I knew that people were not going to be getting paid for magazines anymore. And, you know, you'd have to shoot for like Condé Nast or Hearst, you know, Elle and Vogue. And I just had that conversation with myself. I was like, you know what? I don't think I want to do that. Yeah. It's like, how can you shift things to work in your favor more, you know? And then I started thinking about the podcast and then getting into art sales. And, you know, I met Justin on uh, the podcast and then we created no wave. And so like, I think there are still ways to do things as an artist, but being able to shift the perspective a bit to understand what your sensibilities are and then dissecting that and then figuring out ways to make things more sustainable. And this is just a constant challenge that I am always running in my head. Like, okay, how do you continue to make what you like to do sustainable? You know? So it's like, there's, there's ways, you know, it's, online workshops or like, you know, doing, you know, even doing like a, like a, like a platform, like a dance platform and things like that. I mean, anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know, I guess like the, the interesting thing is like life in general on a macro perspective always challenges us. And I mean, this goes back to, to dance, you know, it's like, dance has made you into a resilient person because of the constant rejections. And this is just another chapter that's opening up to challenge you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, with what you were saying, I mean, I think you put it better than I could have, but yeah, I think like to make that next move, it is finding how you can implement what you've done in the past and how you can make something sustainable. And that's why Congress is a huge thing for me. It's a reoccurring show. I I know dance better than anyone. Just kidding. But like, you know, <laughs> well, I, can, I mean, I can, not, I can, not just kidding. You do. <laughs> I can use it. But like I can use it and have a reoccurring show so that I can show the audience great dancers in L.A. every two months, you know. And then we're also thinking about doing this online thing. And it's just like that sustainability, which is a different mind shift and you just have to know how to switch your mind because it's different. It is creative, but it's more of the business savvy kind of mindset. And it's, it's that shift that I think is hard for people. Mm -hmm. And it's scary to go into because once you're a performer or an artist, you know that world. And then all of a sudden you have to stop and go behind the scenes a little bit and create something different for the audience if that yeah. makes sense mm -hmm. but i think you're totally right it's finding that sustainability it's just yeah. figuring out what it is for yourself yeah mm -hmm. i think about this so i i don't know if you knew this but i've been a martial artist since i was 20 years old i didn't know that yeah and so i actually wanted to be a professional mma fighter like when i was in my early 20s and i was thinking about it and i was competing in tournaments like brazilian jiu-jitsu tournaments and stuff and i was like man this is really fucking tough on your body, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure you encounter uh, something similar with dancing. I mean, the way that you dance, it's, you know, it's very emotive. It's a lot of energy. And I would imagine you have had injuries in the past that um, sustain over time, you know? So it's like, I think even with that, like the physicality of it, 
understanding like how much a body can take, how much your body can take, you know? And I don't know, that's just something I've thought about just being an athlete as well. Yeah. I mean, I think all athletes have to think about that, but of course there's like certain sports or skills that you have to like stop, you know, a ballerina's life is career is over at 17, 18, Mm. you know, and then, and then what is she going to do or he going to do, you know, same thing with dance, you know, your body, your body can only go so far. Same with fighting, same with any physical activity that you can do. You can only go so far and it's like, you can take care of yourself as much as you want, but there is going to come a day when your body's going to be like, you know what? That's cute, but I have to stop now. And it's also like being injured. I mean, who knows what type of injury it is, but like you're so susceptible to like ACL tears, ACL sprains, ankle sprains. I remember one time I popped my knee while I was performing at a bar. And of course there's no workers comp, of course not. And I had to be out for like two months, Mm. you know, or I broke anything. I didn't, it just popped and I couldn't dance for two months. But then I broke my fourth metatarsal in dance class and I was out for four months. Mm. It's like, damn. Yeah. I mean, that's why, you know, I mean, women having babies, it's like, if you're an actress, unless you're, you have a lot of money, like they did in, um, super, what was the, she was five months pregnant. What movie was that? She was five months pregnant. Does it start with super? Is it super? Was it super? No, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, wait, uh, so, so there was a, an actress that was five <laughs> months pregnant in the filming of this movie. Yeah, and they CGI'd her stomach out. Wow. But anyways, what I was going to say is that usually, like, if a woman gets pregnant, you can't be in a movie unless you're casted as a pregnant woman. Yeah. You can't dance on tour if you're pregnant. You can't, you know, so that that's a year and a half off. So then what are you supposed to do? Find that sustainability. Yeah. It's super <laughs> difficult. Not not even talking about, like, the emotional side of of bearing a child and the, the, the things hormonally that you go through. Um, yeah. It's just taxing um, on the body. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, look at football players. Oh yeah. All those CTE brain injuries oh my gosh. and boxers. Yeah. It's insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, <clears throat> there's going to come a time for every, every athlete to like go through it. But going back to sustainability, how do you use, what you know and create something for your life that Mm -hmm. that can change that, you know? Yeah. You know, it's like, how do you have this sort of like love and romantic perspective on life in general going through a lot of these changes in life or, you know, things that um, could break you down physically, mentally, you know, like a breakup or like a, uh, you know, like all those things, like how do you still, how do you overcome that? And, um, become a better person from it, you know, and those challenges will always exist mm-hmm. till we're dead. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I think like, I mean, I feel like it, it's a collective answer maybe for artists, but you tell me what you think. But I feel like whenever those challenges come up, I always go straight to my art, whether it's a breakup or it's, a death or something crazy happened to me today where some guy made me mad. I don't know anything. I go straight to the art because that's when I can get out my emotions. That's when I can get out my feelings. That's when I can get out everything that I feel about it. And then art is, you know, art is my therapy, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Especially just because dance is physical. Dance is my art is physical. I feel like the physicality of it helps you release all of that emotional tent like anxiety and tenseness and is letting your body like get it out physically Mm -hmm. you know yeah but i don't know how do you do it (sighs) well i have to work out every day yeah (laughs) see (laughs) that that uh especially doing it in the morning it immediately releases any sort of built up tension that and writing Mm -hmm. writing helps a lot so Mm -hmm. that you can visually see yourself doing this thing 
putting words on a paper and understanding that these feelings are real. Mm -hmm. And I think having a lot of those emotional check-ins and becoming more emotionally intelligent as we get older, I mean, it's, it's super healthy, you know, Mm -hmm. I've had really strange conversations with people, especially men who harbor their feelings and it's really, it's really interesting. It's really interesting to like have a conversation with like anyone that kind of like hides away their, their feelings and emotions. And maybe because I've tr- trained myself to not mm-hmm. that it just, it just, it's hard to relate almost. Yeah. It's very hard to relate because they're not being honest. They're not being honest with themselves and they're not being honest with you. So of course it's hard to relate. How can you relate to that? Hmm. You can't at yeah. all. Yeah. And that's a, that's so sad. Like I've I talked to those those individuals as well and I wish that I could just hug them and they could just cry for as long as they wanted. You know, because they feel like that's just all they need to do mm. is just cry maybe. Um and it's just also not healthy to keep all of that emotion inside of your body because it needs to be released. Like this mm. is where like I feel that cancer stems from I feel that other chronic illnesses stem from is when you keep all of those emotions inside of your body I mean the body is a beautiful vessel it can heal anything it like it's the most amazing vessel we have it can heal everything Mm -hmm. but if you harbor all of these negative energies or emotions into your body of course your body is going to accept it and it's going to think that it should live like this and then you're going to get sick Mm -hmm. yeah no, I agree. So, uh, those poor people. Hmm. In the in the arts, we don't encounter. I mean, because you know, as an artist, you have to be emotionally vulnerable in certain ways to um, express something, and we encounter that sort of um, those sort of ideologies like less in the arts. Mm-hmm. But I think like, yeah, it's interesting, like, you know, on the business side, like talking to people on the business side and then, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's a lot more, um, commonplace than, yeah, com- it's a lot more commonplace, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I also think it's, it's definitely conditioned. That's for sure. Mm. But yeah, mm. you know, I also think that we're in a new age of trying to break that cycle Mm. at least in at least in the progressive states i want to say i don't know about the (laughs) other ones yeah but like my son for example he has he has a class like he has emotional emotional i forget what it's called but emotional classes every week and last week he learned about empathy and how he can be more empathetic towards his classmates Mm. and towards himself And I think if you keep that dialogue open, because it's normal to feel things, it's normal to feel sad and frustrated. And as long as we normalize it, because it is, Mm -hmm. then there's no shame or guilt about feeling a certain way. Yeah. And just letting it pass through. Mm -hmm. But I also think, like, why are artists more open to being vulnerable? That's so interesting. Is that a personality trait? that They're just more willing to being vulnerable and sharing their emotions? rather than the business guy who works on wall street, you know, like what, what is that difference? I think there's a certain amount of competitiveness that comes with being sort of some sort of like staunch business executive person. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's almost like becoming a caricature of themselves Because it's like, oh, well, other business people act like this. Mm -hmm. So I need to act like this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, it's really just like another microcosm of like our human experience of like how we intake information and utilize that information to what we think might be beneficial for us, whether it's like, you know, gaining like a higher position at work or, or whatever. So, but I think with artists, you have to tap into that to yourself if you want to create artwork from like an honest place. But I mean, you see it in the arts too. I mean, I think there's a lot of people in general that aren't honest with themselves and, you know, maybe they acquire these skill sets, these techniques, and they can do these pieces that they know that will sell, 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's an expression. You know, I think a lot of people are just lost in general, whether mm -hmm. it's the business person or like the lost artist. But mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to examine that just from the human experience level. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because like thinking about it now, it like we're hearing you talk. It makes a lot of sense because thinking that just like a normal business guy, what he or she is working on their entire day for the week is like all logical or it's very database or it's very like logistical and they never have to deal with anything creatively or like touch in tune with like how they feel about yeah. that, you know? Yeah. But then on the opposite side, an artist is tapping into that, but not necessarily thinking of logistics. Like I know as an artist, I need to work on that mm. for myself. Like mm. I need to really logically speaking, cognitively, I have to work on that for myself because the creative and the feelings that I can tap into that any day. But if I want to like get back to reality, that's, that's actually difficult for me. Like I have to focus on reality or like, you know, smart decision business making. Mm -hmm. I have to really focus on that. Yeah. So I wonder if it's the same kind of push and pull for the nine to five as it is for me as an artist to like sit here and think about daily life logistics, mm -hmm. accounting. Yeah. And stuff. It's like the inverse. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a similar inverse yes. of ideologies. Yes. Because I mean, if you think about it, like, probably a majority of the people that you hang around, um, you are able to express yourself, have this sort of like honest dialogue. And then if you think about the business person, it's like, of course they're thinking in a way that is binary and, you know, and to the books and like logistical. Um, and it's funny to think that that is, that mindset is considered practical because I think what's more practical is being able to balance between both, to be able to like toggle between the emotional side and the logistical side. And actually I, I was listening to this podcast with Robert Rodriguez and he was talking about his mentor when he was a kid and he worked at this photo store and he was saying that he was telling him, you know, you're great on the creative side, but you really need to work on being technical. And I think like being able to balance those things out, he said that you can be unstoppable, mm. which makes sense. And I mean, you know, and I think that's why like artists also need to be business minded and artistically minded because they both benefit each other. And whether that's adding someone to your team, that's the business person and you can just focus on the art side, then that's, that's great too, but mm -hmm. it's about finding the, who, who that person is, who mm -hmm. is that person mm -hmm. and, and understanding and being honest with yourself. Like I don't have these particular sensibilities. That person does. Yeah. I trust this person. Yes. So yes. let's, let, let's work together and try to sim <laughs> symbiotically like yes. figure this shit out. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause a lot of times I'm with my friends and we're like, yeah, we want to do a show. We want to create a show and we, we get down all of the, all of the details down, right? We know what the show is going to be. We know everything. Yeah. How are we going to get money for this? Oh, right. How are we going to book a space? You know, like we don't know because yeah. we, we delve in the just creative process so much that we forget about, oh, wait, there's actually business de decisions that we have to make. Yeah. So it is finding that collaboration. Yeah. That and other half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And finding who gets excited for that. And yes. I mean, this is this is another just like. Uh, this is, you know, even speaking of like, um, having like a partner, like a romantic partner, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, how do you, how do you two balance each other out? You know, and this is something that I've been thinking about recently. It's like, how do you find that person that you're able to balance each other out and work towards like a similar goal or something? You yes, know? absolutely. Yeah. Well, is that, I mean, is that how your guys' relationship is? Uh, romantically, me and no. Justin. <laughs> I mean, I can't talk about that on the podcast. His wife listens to this. Asia, if you're listening, I'm sorry, oh God, but so I'm scary. romantically involved with Justin. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, 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 definitely. Justin's definitely more of the creative, um, 
he's more geared towards creatively minded things. And that's why I say that I'm half split down the middle art artist, half business. Oh, you have it figured out. No, I don't have it figured out. I'm figuring it out. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. I'm like, help me. <laughs> I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. This is why we're having this conversation. <laughs> I have, <laughs> I, I'm not saying that I have nothing figured out, but you know, it's like, it's, it's fun to constantly figure things out. I think I, I hope. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. If you're, what, what is that saying? If you're not learning, you're dead or something. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, we always have to keep pushing, always have to keep learning. Mm -hmm. There's always something to learn because no one has life figured out, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because with Zach and I doing Congress, it's really interesting because he's the poetic. He has a bachelor's, maybe even a master's, I don't know, in literature, poetry. I don't know. Some mm -hmm. shit that I just don't care about. I have a mm -hmm. sailor mouse, so we are the yin and yang of like – all that shit. He's concert world. I guess I'm commercial. Mm. So I get the collaboration. You do need to find that in order to have the balance or if you can find the balance within yourself, which is great. I'm so happy you're on your way. <laughs> I have yet to continue to work on that. I mean, I don't Dang want to give it. you a false impression. I am not like a Buddhist figure <laughs> or I'm not like a <laughs> no, you sound great I'm not like a Buddha figure or anything you sound I, great I'm just trying just like you we're, we're all figuring this this shit out together that's right yeah that's right well um having such a great time on th having this conversation <laughs> I feel like I should just ask one more question though okay um, do it I hope I know an answer what is your advice for artists and creatives Oh my gosh, that question? Yeah, that question. <laughs> what is my advice for artists and creatives? My advice for artists and creatives, I mean, I kind of tapped into it earlier, but I think that you need to be yourself. Find yourself as much as you can. If it doesn't feel like home, it's not you, and that's the wrong way. If you run into that wall that is fearful, you need to keep going even if it hurts, even if it causes pain. You need to break through it because that will be your breakthrough as an artist and a creative. If it feels safe, it's not worth it. If it feels unsafe, it's worth it. Trust that everything happens for a reason. Accept that all of your work is not going to be great. You will make mistakes and it's okay. And that's it. That's great. Cool. That's great. <laughs> that was great. That was amazing. I, I do want to end on this one little uh, on this one little Quote. tidbit. <laughs> okay. So my friend posted this on Instagram, and I reposted it. Okay. Um, top oh. nine regrets people have at the end of the, of their life. Oh. <laughs> okay. I wish I had been more loving to the people who matter the most. I wish I had been a better spouse, parent, or child. I wish I had not spent so much time working. I wish I had taken more risks. I wish I had been happier, enjoyed life more. I wish I had lived my own dream. I wish I had taken better care of myself. I wish I'd have, been, I'd have done more for others. I wish I had chosen work that was meaningful for me. That's really deep. And that makes me question my life. <laughs> <laughs> constant, in constant Damn flux it. and questioning everything. Damn it. But then I was just thinking about my, I was like, oh my gosh, what if he asked me what one of my regrets is? And I was like, like going through the Rolodex of like, oh my God, uh -huh. what is my regret? Uh -huh. I don't have any, thankfully. Oh, that's good. No, it's great. But... I think that if you were to ask me that question and I had to come up with an answer though. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I would say that I would regret ever having self doubt uh, as an artist. Uh, yeah. Anyways, that's my answer even though you didn't ask. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for answering your own question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you, do you have one? A regret? Oh, man. Right? It's pretty serious. 
Yeah, you're, you're, you're flipping it on me. It's pretty serious. You don't have to answer it, actually. Oh, well, now, I'm, now I'm thinking. Like if you got to look at your past career, maybe, or like past work. Yeah. Maybe. Um, not following my instincts. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. When you know that there's like the answer is right in front of you and you feel gutturally <laughs> that yes. you should act in a different way, yeah. but you just go with the inertia of the situation. Yeah. That's a good one. I feel like everyone can relate to that. That's a good one. Yeah. Great. Don't have self doubt and go with your instinct. That's it. Yeah. That's there we go. The end of the podcast. That's yeah. great. Yeah. That's the end of the podcast. That's inspiration. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we have it all figured out now. <laughs> just, just trust your intuition and, uh, and live life. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, that, that was good. It's yeah. Good. Well, all right. We'll just leave it there. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for shooting today. And thanks, Dan. yeah, I'm glad that we, this is our first time sitting down and having a conversation. This was the best conversation I've ever had. I felt so uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. It was so good. You had me actually thinking it was really good. Good job. Oh, well, I mean, good job, dude. Yo, you go deep though. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Only sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thanks. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. Creative producer is Kelly Kekich, and editing help by Matthew A. Paul.